In this video, we'll be discussing scalars, vectors, and static equilibriums. Let's begin with the scalar quantity. We can define scalar as a quantity that has magnitude or size, but without direction. To give a few examples, we have distance, speed, mass, energy, temperature, and volume. We represent scalar quantities with a numerical value followed by its unit. Let's take a book as an example with two quantities, mass and temperature. Firstly, does it make sense to associate these quantities to the book? Well, the book does in fact have mass and a temperature. So, it does make sense. Now ask yourself, does it make sense to put a direction with these quantities? For example, the mass of the book is 5 kilograms to the right. Or the temperature of the book is 15 degrees Celsius to the left. Well, that doesn't really make sense. So, in a sentence, if we put a direction to a quantity, and it doesn't seem to make sense, we can use that as a form of testing to see whether or not the quantity is, in fact, scalar. Moving on to vector quantities, we can define a vector as a quantity that has both magnitude and a direction. To give a few examples, we have displacement, velocity, acceleration, force, and weight. Let's represent a vector quantity by considering the forces that are acting on a ball. Here is an example. We can see the force F1 of 5 newtons acting on a ball. The direction is represented by the arrowhead and the magnitude by the length. So, the ball is currently moving to the right. Say a force F2 of 10 newtons, represented in a red arrow, is acting on the same ball, but in the opposite direction. Taking the right-hand side as the positive, the resultant force on the ball would be 5 newtons minus 10 newtons, which would give negative 5 newtons or 5 newtons to the left. Let's do another example. We have forces F3 of 10 newtons to the right and F4 of 5 newtons to the left. What do you think the resultant force would be? Taking the right-hand side as the positive, the resultant force on the ball would be 10 newtons minus 5 newtons which would give positive 5 newtons or 5 newtons to the right. Unlike scalar quantities where the magnitudes can just be added together to get a definitive answer, it is important to take direction of the forces into account when working with vectors. If, say, the force on the object is acting in the opposite direction, the forces should be subtracted, as we saw on the example. Vectors can be resolved into two components using trigonometry the two components being horizontal and vertical. An example of this is a ball moving at a constant velocity. We can draw the axes taking the right-hand side and up as positive. The ball is moving at a constant velocity of v meters per second at an angle of theta from the horizontal. We want to resolve the force into its x and y components, which are represented by the red arrows. If I were to put the red arrows together head to tail, you can see it forms a right angle triangle where the hypotenuse is the initial vector quantity v. From here, we can use Sokatoa to find three expressions for the angle. tan theta equals vy over vx, cos theta equals vx over v, sin theta equals vy over v. Using cos and sin, we can calculate the horizontal and vertical components given the angle theta and the resultant vector v. Rule of thumb. Use the cosine expression when resolving the vector through the angle and use sin when resolving the vector away from the angle. Let's move on to calculating the resultant vector. If two perpendicular vector components are given, the resultant vector is calculated using Pythagoras' theorem. We can draw the vector v with its x and y components. For example, the resultant velocity is given by v squared equals vx squared plus vy squared. The resultant vector can also be calculated using trigonometry if one of the components and the angle is known. You can refer to the equations derived using Sokatoa. In a static equilibrium, the resultant force acting on a body is zero. Therefore, all the forces along the line of action must balance. Let's look at a few examples. In the first example, 
we have a light and extensible string. Here we can make two assumptions. By light, we mean that the string has no mass. And by an extensible, we mean that it does not stretch. So, we have a fixed point, like a ceiling. A ball is attached to the ceiling using a light and extensible string. In this case, there are two forces acting on the ball. The weight of the ball and the tension on the string. Since the ball is in static equilibrium, the resultant force must be zero. This means that the two opposing forces should be equal. Now, what if we had more than one string? In example two, we have a ball attached to two fixed points A and B using two light and extensible strings. Firstly, we can mark the weight. Then, we have the tension forces acting along the two strings at an angle theta from the horizontal. In this case, since the tension is distributed along two strings, it must be resolved vertically. Referring back to Sokka Toa, we can see that the vertical component can be found using T sine theta. As the tension is distributed along two strings, it is calculated twice. This gives us 2T sine theta, giving us the final equation 2T sine equals mg. For the third example, we will be working with a smooth slope. Here we can make an assumption that on any smooth surface, there are no frictional forces exerted. Here we have a smooth slope at an angle theta from the horizontal. On the slope, we have a ball attached to a box using a light and extensible string. The mass of the ball is M and the mass of the box, capital M. We can label the weight of each object and then the tension in the string. As the ball is touching the slope, there will also be normal contact force perpendicular to the slope. How do we find the relationship between M and capital M? Firstly, we need to resolve the weight of the ball into its horizontal and vertical components to the slope. When we resolve it, we get mg cos theta as the vertical component and mg sin theta as the horizontal, represented in purple arrows. Now that we have resolved the forces acting on the ball, we can consider them parallelly and perpendicularly to the slope. Let's begin with the parallel forces. We can see that the only forces acting on the ball is the tension and the horizontal component of the weight. Note that the angle of the slope and the angle between the weight vector and its vertical component to the slope, they are both theta as the triangles are similar. This gives T equals mg sine theta. Taking perpendicular forces, we get N equal to the vertical component of the weight, mg cos theta. You can pause the video and check to see if you understand. Now consider the forces on the box. Here we don't need to resolve anything as the forces acting on it are vertical only. Therefore, T equals mg. We can assume the tensions on the string on both sides are equal, as they are essentially just one light and extensible string. With that in mind, we can equate equations 1 and 3 to produce a new expression for M and capital M. We can now find the ratio between the mass of the ball and the box. In this case, the ratio between the two masses would be sine theta. In the final example, we will be working on a rough slope. A rough surface exerts a frictional force on the object. One thing to note is that friction always acts oppositely to the direction of motion that the object would be subjected to. So let's make this clearer. Here we have a rough slope at an angle theta from the horizontal. There is a box of mass m on the slope. Naturally, the weight of the box would pull the box down the slope, thus making the frictional force act upwards parallel to the slope. We also have the normal contact force of the box. Okay, we want to find the expression for the coefficient of friction denoted by the Greek letter mu. Just like example three, we need to resolve the weight of the box into its horizontal and vertical components to the slope. The vertical component comes to mg cos theta and the horizontal mg sine theta. In this equation, the frictional force is mu multiplied by n, where mu is the coefficient of friction and n the normal contact force. This doesn't appear on some of the physics syllabuses, but it is a general equation for friction. 
Equations 2 and 3 are what you get when you resolve horizontally and vertically. By equating equations 1 and 2, we get our fourth equation, mu n equals mg sine theta. Now by substituting equations 3 into 4, we get mu mg cos theta equals mg sine theta. We can now divide both sides by mg cos theta to get mu equals sine theta over cos theta, or just tan theta, which is the ratio between sine theta and cos theta. So, the value of mu can be determined if you know the angle of the slope. That is to say, the friction acting on the box depends on the angle the slope is making to the horizontal. Well, that's it for this video. If you have any questions or you are unsure about something, you can leave a comment below. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe for more.